Hey everyone, welcome to the Wonderful World, the Remnant Radio. My name is Joshua Lewis, and today I've got Dawson in the studio, and we're going to be discussing yep. Jeremiah 23 and Yum. the prophets in Jeremiah's day. It's going to be an exciting uh, time of study together, but before we dive into the subject, I want to let you know a little bit about who Remnant Radio is and what we're all about. Uh, Remnant Radio is a theology broadcast. We interview pastors, teachers, uh, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. Our goal is to get you outside of your theological echo chamber. We're going to suspend our thoughts, our background, our understanding just momentarily so we can learn and glean from other Christians within the Orthodox Christian faith. Uh, if that's something that you're interested in, you want to learn about all the ologies, the homarchiologies, the, the soteriologies, the eschatologies, all those ologies, make sure to subscribe as we're coming out with tons of content just like this. Uh, furthermore, if you're blessed by our ministry and you want to support what we're doing here at Remnant Radio, we're entirely crowdfunded, so you can give there on PayPal in the link of the description of this video or on Patreon. As low as five bucks a month helps support the channel. So uh, that is all. Without further ado, Dawson, it's glad to have you back, man. Hey, it's glad to be here. Love well, it. So we're talking about Jeremiah 23. Um, tell me why Jeremiah 23, why are we talking about it today? Uh, there's lots of verses, there's lots of chapters in the Bible, Dawson, <laughs> and we don't typically do verse by verse Bible studies. Yeah, no, we don't. Typically, uh, yeah. So what means this? Uh, it's just very important for today. We, uh, we're living in a day where, um, just like in Jeremiah's day, that there's a lot of prophetic conflict. Okay. Um, in Jeremiah's day, uh, there's actually a famous book written on this, a scholarly book called Prophetic Conflict, which deals with uh, the battles because chapters 23 through about 29 are nothing but uh, Jeremiah's dealings with other prophets and the conflict that came there uh, due to people being deceived and being uh, caught up in the spirit of the age and the beliefs of their day and having, uh, having those beliefs shape and mold how they uh, began to interpret what they thought they saw. So uh, leading up into this point, we've got tons of verses in Jeremiah discussing various different things. You said Jeremiah 23 is like the greatest hits of Jeremiah. Oh, yes. Uh, this is pulling from multiple sections of this book, kind of giving a synopsis mm -hmm. of what's happening. Yeah. Can you explain that to me? So, okay. So Jeremiah is laid out not in chronological order. It's laid out in a semi-chronological order with um, sections that they say, oh, okay, you know, it'd be better to kind of put all this stuff together and put mm -hmm. all this stuff together. The editor, Baruch, um, when he compiled it, um, they compiled it in that way because they knew they were going to be sending it to uh, uh, to the uh, exiles. So Jeremiah didn't write the book of Jeremiah. Oh, no, he That's wrote important. the book. Hey, well, uh, he it's his words and his message uh, by the pen of Baruch. So uh, it's generally said that he is the author, uh, but not the... Um, Composer. Composer. So it'd be the equivalent of someone writing a book today and having an editor or... Um, an amanuensis. An ama oh, wh wh what is an amanuensis? I don't even know. Okay. What a fancy word, Dawson. <laughs> That's a $3 word. Well, oh my. So yes. Um, amanuensis is just someone who who, who scribes, who, who okay. does, does scribe. So like we, we say Paul wrote the book of Romans all the time, but there was actually a guy who wrote Romans for him. Yeah, it's like, I, a, I like always, a, that trick Bible trivia question. Yeah, there's that guy, you know, there's that guy in heaven that's like, every time someone preacher says that, he's like, come on, yeah. my well, name's in there. I didn't ghostwrite that. He <laughs> gave me credit. No, okay, so exactly, here's, here's, exactly. Here's the thing. So It's ethical. So we got, we got uh, Jeremiah 23 is a synopsis. Give us the historical context and background of Jeremiah. What's going on? Okay. You told us a little bit about some of the prophets, but like, mm -hmm. what's what's the historical context that Jeremiah The historical is context uh Jeremiah is writing in a time of uh, great upheaval, and um, at the same time, it's a time of uh, great national pride, great moral collapse, um, and the institutions of his day um, had become twisted. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a lot of systemic issues. Um, there was a lot of issues of, um, of oppression by the king uh, to build his his uh, castles. But to give you a brief synopsis, you're, you've got Jeremiah's born um, a little, some say a little bit before uh, the reign of um, Josiah, who's considered the, the last righteous king of Israel, mm -hmm. of Judah. And um, although it, I would contest, and I think it's pretty, it's pretty uh, clear that Josiah's, and this is kind of important for understanding Jeremiah, the book, his revival, there's you probably you probably heard a sermon on it, mm -hmm. um, was not as revival and not as much um, a true move of God 
although it was, there's some elements that were definitely, that definitely developed, but it was a top down revival, not a bottom up. Mm -hmm. Um, and because it was top down, um, when things are top down, you just smush down the evil and it hides. Um, and that's what happened. Um, so you have, you have that happening as he comes onto the scene and as he said, and he gives his, uh, like three years, I think three or eight years into, uh, into that. God calls Jeremiah to start preaching. He starts preaching during that time. He, he's, uh, he's highly influenced by Hosea. He reads Hosea. Uh, they find Deuteronomy in the temple and he starts reading Deuteronomy and it's, it's all over the book. Every scholar is going to tell you Deuteronomy is like in the meat and bones of the book of Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. So moving into that, Josiah dies and he continues to minister and he has one of the longest ministries in, uh, in, in the prophets. He continues to minister through three, uh, if you don't count the guys who, who, who were like kings for like three months, mm -hmm. he, he, he's, he's uh, prophesied during, during about three, I think it was five kings, but three kings, a major uh, sections all the way up until the exile, which is that what he, what he one of the things he prophesied uh, constantly was, um, hey, there's these people coming from the north. That's his first prophecies. And the thing about his prophecies, they were very interesting is they continue to to move. Um, they get more and more precise as he get as he gets older because mm -hmm. he he the Lord's continually teaching him. Um, so generally, that's the that's the historical context. Uh, so from that. And this is this is probably the important key, is that from that during that time, you have the kings of Israel, um, first uh, second Kings twenty two, that basically uh, it kind of shows that that there's this thing called the court prophets. So uh, the prophets are are now a part of the court of the king, and the king, will, you know, as counselors, will say, "Hey, what, what's the Lord saying?" And they'll say, "Oh, king, things are great," um, because hey, kings is their meal ticket. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can look, and I'm in one of the, the guide that, that I wrote up. I kind of laid out from a from the prophet's perspective how the different economic situations and uh, through chapter uh, Second Kings chapter twenty two through twenty, I think it's twenty five. Um, those chapters are are key in um, in understanding Jeremiah historically, but generally speaking. You had these prophets, and this gets to our text. You have these prophets who um, are caught up in the beliefs of the day about the temple, about its uh, its uh, and uh, its invulnerability. It's it's never going to God's going to defend it no matter what. Um, they get caught up in um, realizing that if they if they said anything bad, then they lost their meal ticket in the king. So they so they were always uh, you know making sure the king felt good about the words they were giving um, rather than listening to the Lord and speaking truly. Um, and they began to, uh, these were people who, who were not, they were Israelites. They weren't leading people astray. They were, they were truly gifted. So they were, they were Jewish prophets yeah. who uh, were, were hearing from God. Well, whether they're hearing from God or not is, I don't know that it's, it's explicitly stated in the text, but yeah. they are called by Jeremiah as prophets. Mm -hmm. They are uh, they love Yahweh as far as we can tell. They have a uh, a Jewish worldview system. They don't they don't have a kind of worldview system that's like of a pagan god of Baal well, or that's, Asher. That's where it gets complicated okay. because um, when Josiah came in and um, squashed down, because Josiah's dad was was a heathen. I mean, he put right. the, he put the H in heathen. Right. You know, I mean, he, he, uh, actually promoted bell worship, um, to the point where when Josiah came in and he, and he cracked down on all that, um, he, they just destroyed the sites, the high places. Mm -hmm. Um, so was there, um, was there a, a mingling, you know, um, okay, I guess, I guess I better speak in the name of Yahweh, not Baal from now on, uh, type thing. Mm -hmm. There, there might have been. Might there's, have been. There's a. It, it seems. It seems to imply that. Possible, some probable. Sense. Oh yeah. There's places in Jeremiah which seems to imply that. Um, so there's a mixed bag of people. So there's everything from from guys who are disingenuous, who would we we who the Bible clearly categorizes as a false false prophet in terms of prophesying out of a different spirit, different veil, okay. uh, a different religion. Um, then there was also in that same court, there were those who had true gifts and were just caught up in the uh, nationalism of their day in the belief that, which in what I mean by that is just the belief that 
uh, that the Davidic monarch, um, as long as there was a, a line of David on the throne, that God was obligated to take care of, it, of Judah, and no matter what they did, no matter how they acted, no matter how, all the I'm conditions. I'm resisting application points because you told me not to I'm, resist <laughs> application points. I'm like, my, 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 doesn't that sound familiar to something? But we'll, we'll, let, it, we'll let it slide. <laughs> Would you put it and quiver in the back of your head? Yeah, yeah. Um, put, that, put a pin that. <laughs> pin that. Um, my, my 1800s language, I've been reading too much Edwards. Sure. Um, put a quiver in it. Uh, but anyway, so... So we, uh, from that you have uh, you have uh, true prophets, and then you also have uh, guys who who are true, but they they fall into the zeitgeist of the age. They have bad beliefs about the temple. There's they begin to have bad theology, et cetera, et cetera. Which all these things warp your perception of God. Um, and then from that, what you see with that section, then you have true prophets, which is. Right. Jeremiah, let's say the minority here, because there was in Jeremiah, there's like four guys mentioned, mm-hmm. uh, and one of them got killed by Zedekiah. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> oh no, uh, Josiah, Jebed- one of the J's, one of the I's. Yeah. So anyway, J's and I's. So anyway, they uh, they out of all that, um, with this middle group is the predominant is the predominant group, um, but. Because there's all this, there's all this mixture of um, of pagan worship and them coming out of um, Josiah's dad's reign and and him squashing it down, and all of a sudden, because of Josiah squashing everything down, everything became very, shall we say, Jewish, mm-hmm. um, with a heart that was far less that. And Jeremiah has a word for that. It's called secker. Uh, uh, S H E Q E R. Um, and what it means is it means lie, deception, mm. fake, false. And here's my favorite uh, translate pretentious. Mm. So what it means is, is, is it something that is hollow on the inside, but projects a good religious image? Mm. Um, I grew up, you know, small town, small town Baptist. So to me, that rings very true to some of the people I know that, project an image of being a Christian, but are the farthest thing from it. Um, but they have a very civil, uh, civil religion. Um, you know, they would call themselves a Christian, but if you talked to them or you saw how they lived, it was nowhere near that. Sure. Um, so that's what you got going on in the, in this culture. And these people who, who may have these true gifts are also influenced by that paganism, influenced by that morality, influenced, and they're allowed them, allowing themselves to be influenced. Mm-hmm. And it's slowly shaping the way they think and interpret so that it gets to a point where they're not seeking in- intimacy with God. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I'll say this. Seeking intimacy with God, they're letting things passively happen to them. That's why they always focus on dreams. That's why they always focus on these things that are very passively received rather than heartfelt devotion to God and worship hmm. and times with God. And Jeremiah goes out of his way. Like he, everything he talks about is he, he received a, the, the word. It's a, it's a theologically steep for first time. The word is considered very theologically steeped in the Bible uh, is, is in Jeremiah. So, so in our space, when we talk about prophecy, cause we, we would both admit that our prophecy, like not you and I are, but the, the camp that we run in, if you will, mm-hmm. um, that that camp is also, uh, they allow theology to paint their prophetic word. Uh, in uh, a kind of a funnel sort of way, not mm-hmm. in a, we don't want our prof- our theological preferences to affect what the Lord is saying necessarily. But if we do know what the Lord is saying, we know what he's not saying, right? Yes. So uh, there's a story in Sam Storm's book on um, a comprehensive guide to spiritual gifts. Mm-hmm. The un- yeah. So in, in that one, he talks about a woman who gets up at his church and shares a word um, about God being lonely. And he was like, well, you know, I know what she meant. And like, I understand, yeah. like, but, but I had to pass through that moment. And I explained to her, like, God isn't lonely. Like, that's not possible. Like, because we know who God is. We know what his nature is. Like, it was just a pastoral moment where he came in and, and, and cared for this woman and taught her more accurately the scriptures. So we find that you can't prophesy something that is mm-hmm. outside of the line of scripture, right? So these individuals are actually 
In fact, they're doing that, but they have a, a poor view of scripture. They have a poor view of God's already written word. Uh-huh. Like you're talking about, they have this idea that David is going to sit on the throne. And if any anyone from the line of David is on the throne, God is obligated to do X, Y, and Z. And all of a so, sudden that he can be easily manipulated. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this this uh, this idea is a, a theological one that affects their understanding. So how do we, and this is, uh, this is again, this is application point, but yeah, go right ahead. I, I'm curious, like how do we, not confuse our interpretation of what scripture says with what scripture says. I think there's a That's general a thing. Yeah, there's a general there's a general there, I think there's uh, some wiggle room. Okay. Um there's good fences. Mm-hmm. Uh those fences are orthodoxy and not, you know, I mean there's uh nature of God, death, you know, resurrection. Exactly. General general nature of God stuff. Um and honestly, general understanding of worldview stuff. Uh, for example, I, I have a friend who long, long time ago who had a uh, who had a word, and she was telling me about it. And she was like, "Yeah, uh, I was like sitting there riding my horse, and and it was like God was saying that, uh, you know." He said, "I am the spirit of the horse," and I was like, "Okay, hun." <laughs> I was curious where that was going. <laughs> you said it with such enthusiasm. Yeah, I was like, uh. Have you ever heard of pantheism? And she goes, no. Okay, let me tell you what pantheism is. Pantheism is this belief that God is in everything. God is everything. Um, and so there's no difference between the creator and the creature. Um, and that is not a biblical idea. Oh, okay. Oh, well, then he wasn't saying that. And then she thought on it, came back to me, and she goes, she goes, you know, I still feel like he said that, but I think this is what it means. And it was just much more of a, hey, it was, it, she, she said, you know, it's just much more of an understanding of, of uh, a metaphor for strength. Because she sure. read the passages in the Psalms that talk about, that describe the strength sure. of the Lord like a strong, like a strong horse, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, or chari- I think it's a contrast with the chariots. The chariots. The, you have with the chariots of the uh, Okay. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Right, no, but I see but what you're saying. But same, that's same point there. We're using these concrete ideas to to create infrastructure in which we can understand. Because, you know, uh, one of the passages we, we cite frequently on the show when talking about prophecy is when Miriam is speaking of Moses, and she's like, hey, God God speaks to him face to face, but for the rest of us, it's like riddles and dark sayings, and like they're... they're there are these things that are kind of hard to comprehend, if you will. Mm-hmm. They're just they're mysterious. Paul says we prophesy through an image darkly. So when when prophesying in such a way where things aren't hyper clear, they're not like super explicit. Yep. It's it's really good to have a, a not really good. It is essential to have a strong biblical foundation mm-hmm. in which to make sense of things that are speculative. Right. That is continually getting stronger. That's right. So it's not a foundation that you just get and say, oh, and I got a foundation. Away. Come and walk on, away. preach. Say it yeah. again for the people in the back. No. So when, <laughs> when when we're talking about when we're talking about a biblical theological foundation, it's that we're really trying to understand God, his word, his his revealed word that is eternal, yes, that yes. is foundational, that is necessary for life and practice and salvation or all the, the, all the will essential. Not it will yes. not change. It never has. It never will. Yes. And then this this other revelation that we admit is broken. We see it in part. We're not po- we're not positive. It's going to be judged. But like we have this infallible infallible revelation and we have this fallible interpretation of prophecy that we are trying to grapple with um so we always build on what is sure before we try to understand you know what is potentially subjective and and to add to that on the um on the the cryptic language uh, of prophetic speech um in job where where it speaks of that Mm -hmm. one thing people people rarely is like I, i used to ask well, why does he do that? Mm-hmm. And it used to drive me crazy. And when I read, read that passage in context, the reason kind of stands out is that generally speaking, the reason he does that is because it makes you seek him more. That's right. So it, it's, it's simple concept that, oh, okay, he's always going to want you to go because he's a good dad, father. Mm-hmm. He's a good father. Uh, he's always going to push you to depend on the strongest thing in the room, mm. on the strongest person in the room, on the smartest person in the room, 
Who do you think that is? That's that's my daddy. Oh, <laughs> say it again, but, bro. You can be preaching. Okay, so we're doing we're doing verse by verse. So it's gonna be hard uh, for yes. me to think that we're not preaching here. So uh, let's let's go nine through eleven. Well, nine through 15, well, let's hit let's hit the overview. Let, let me do the overview. Let's, let's do the, the the greatest hits. Okay, yes, do the greatest. The greatest hits of the greatest hits. Okay, so let's do it. Jeremiah twenty three is um, it's a we could call it the compilation album because most scholars believe it, it's it's. Uh, a bunch of his different messages that they all put together Mm -hmm. because, and this gets to your question earlier, um, because when you read through this material all the way to 29, you're going to learn, you're going to gain what is called a heuristic understanding. And heuristic is different from holistic. Heuristic means um, something that that is absorbed and and grappled, but it's not like, you know, a fact. It kind of just becomes part of you and and helps you understand wisely. So it, it gain, you gain a heuristic understanding. So it has this uh, uh, this aspect of of just bringing wisdom to to your uh, discernment ability. And by discernment, I, I don't mean you know that that feeling on the back of your neck. I mean uh, your ability to slice something clearly based on how God would see it. Um, so that said, that's why they would they they kind of categorize. Uh, Baruch kind of said, okay, I'm going to take these things, boom, put them down there. Um, so he went through and, and uh, Baruch went through and, and developed what we'll call Jeremiah's greatest hits. Mm-hmm. So message one, nine through 15 is the problem with the prophets. It's just a general uh, ju- uh, general judgment with some really good imagery uh, that describes uh, uh, bad prophetic ministry as uh, something that is uh, pollution. Um, and, and, and if you just, the metaphor itself is so spot on in terms of if you've ever been around areas where, uh, I grew, I grew up in a, a country area. So I saw what happens to pesticides when they, when they, uh, corrupt, um, a land or they corrupt a field and you have to let it sit because, because of it. So it's, it's pretty powerful. Uh, so the me- second message is that'll be, uh, 16 through 22, that's uh, don't listen to the prophets. It gives a rationale for why you shouldn't listen to them. Uh, message three is 23 through 24. That's It's three sets of questions real quick back to back uh, to confront the false beliefs that the prophets had. Um, and then message four uh, goes on the heels of that. And it's basically what they're doing wrong. And it gives marks and descriptions of... Um, of the prophets. So it's a good section that you can really get in characteristics of, okay, you can't do that. Mm-hmm. Exactly. This is, this is your space. Yes. Do not go into that space. And the last one's 33 through 40, and it, it's going to lay out um, how Jeremiah needs to deal with the human agendas that he has coming at him, both uh, human agendas that are then saying, thus says the Lord, and human agendas that are coming to him saying, hey, give me a word. Mm-hmm. But the reason they're coming is because they already have an agenda they want God to sign off on. So, or they're just wanting to be sarcastic to him is the debate. So that's, that's the overview of the whole chapter. Uh, that's a lot of content, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, let's jump into it. We'll look at some stuff, some interesting things. So there are, um, there are five different sections that we talked about just prior to this. We're going to spend a lot of time on what is it? Three and four are the ones that we want to spend the most of our time on. So we're going to, we're going to fly through the other numbers. Uh, that that being said, if people want to really do an in-depth study, you've already prepared a study guide for yep. everyone to go check out and read through, and they can do more of an in-depth dive. So we're going to start with that first section in yep. dealing with the with the prophets specifically. Right? Mm-hmm. What's wrong with the prophets? Let's dive in with that there first. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So the beginning uh, with the problem of the prophets, he he's laying out. You can tell actually that this is this first one was definitely in, um, something early in his ministry, mm-hmm. um, because it's a little more general. It's basically a denounce a moral denouncement of um, of the pollution that has been caused by the ministry of both the prophets and the priests. Mm-hmm. Um, Jeremiah is a very interesting figure in, in that in that regard. He uh, he is probably one of the best at painting word pictures. And in this section, 9 through 15, he lays into this word picture of, of pollution um, and describes all kinds of different problems. For example, he, he says, uh, for the land is full of adulterers. This is uh, 
10 through uh, 12. For the land is full of adulterers. Uh, for the land mourns because of, because of the curse. The pasture of the wilderness has dried up. Their courses also is their course also is evil, and they and their might is not right. For both the prophets and the priests are polluted. Even in my house, I have found their wickedness, declares the Lord. Now, there's a lot being said there that's not being said because, uh, like all prophets, when you read the prophets, you're reading once you're hearing one side of a conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, and particularly like just laying this out just for, for starters, when he says the prop, when he says adultery, um, there's a debate within scholars is that, uh, spiritual adultery, which is, uh, um, uh, everything included in spiritual adultery is everything from breaking the commandments to, um, worshiping, other wor- gods. worshiping other gods, idolatry. So there's that. And other people, well, what if it's just adultery, just people sleeping with people who aren't their wives and or aren't their husbands. And the truth is, more than likely, because where it goes from there is it says, and the land mourns because of the curse and the pastures of the wilderness have dried up. Now, all of a sudden, there's this, there's this creation language. It's talking about creation being hurt because of this. Well, that's because Baal worship was a synthesis of uh, fertility mm-hmm. and um, sexuality. That's right. So the Baal and Asherah were the yeah. two parts of the the same coin. Like they were almost spouses, right? Exactly. So like they would have these like sexually immoral escapades up in high places and in low hills, literally to entice these these gods these gods to come together to have relations and so thus produce rain. a fruitful rain and harvest and crop. Yes. Got it. And um he's pointing out that, hey, you're doing the nasty on the high places, but it ain't helping the wilderness. It ain't so helping the rain. So is it both and? Is it both a spiritual idolatry because it's yes. pagan practice that's, that's, and it's... That's Dawson's, that's Dawson's take on uh, it. It's, it's a both and. It's, it's a yes. It's a both and. It's got to be a both and. Um, which kind of really sets the context that these people are... Because now they're not going in public uh, because it's now outlawed at this point. And from jo- Josiah on, it was, all, it was always outlawed. Uh, so... These people are going to these high places mm-hmm. that have obviously been rebuilt, but no one's telling anybody. Mm. And then they go to the temple on Sunday. So um, it is really the essence of hypocrisy. Uh, so you have these people who, who, are, who are saying they're trusting in, in Yahweh and going to the temple and sacrificing and, and uh, uh, being good Israelites. Uh, but then when push comes to shove, where do they find their security and their comfort? And where do they find the the means? Uh, they don't go to the temple and pray uh, for rain. They go um, to Baal. Mm-hmm. So you see where their loyalties lie. Um, that kind of things. He goes on to say, uh, Jeremiah goes on to say from this, he says, hey, that problem is because of their preaching. That mm-hmm. issue, yeah, I know, come on now. <laughs> That problem is because they're preaching. That problem is because they're prophesying. That problem is because they have a toxic religion. Both the priests and the prophets have a toxic religion. It's a beautiful imagery. Mm. And because of that toxic religion, God says at the end, oh, well, he does this great comparison because in, in 13 and 15, it's like he catches, he knows the prophets are going to say something along the lines of, but at least we're not those guys in the Northern kingdom who, who prophesied in the name of Baal. Mm-hmm. Um, and got themselves destroyed. So he goes, he goes, well, you know, they were pretty bad, but you're worse. That's what, that's what he basically says in 13 and 14. He says, you were pretty bad, but you actually, and there's a great wordplay in the Hebrew that I love. It's like, it says, um, moreover, among the prophets of Samaria, I saw an offensive thing. Uh, they prophesied by Baal and led my people astray. Also among the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen a horrible thing. Now in the Hebrew, that's like the same word except for the it, it's nuanced differently in such a way as to say a uh, very very bad thing. It's like like a little kid, like my little son. Um, he was like he, he was like it's so terrible. He, he had huge imagination. He was like, and I was like, what's going on? He goes, my car broke. Car hadn't broke, but I was like, okay, it, it's broke. Yeah, it's broke. Okay, cool. And he 
he goes, this broke really bad. And I was like, how bad is it broke? It's broke really, really bad. So it's, it's like he's saying that. Um, he's basically saying, saying it and emphasizing in such a way that, that he's like, no, you don't realize how bad you are. You're so bad, you're worse than they are. Um, and it's countering an argument they were basically going to justify themselves with. Uh, but then he goes in at the end of 15 and basically says, you know what, I'm going to give you, for the pollution you've sent on the land, I'm going to give you a poison. Um, I'm going to poison you because of your pollution. And that's where he denounces the prophets. So these prophets. And that's 15. That's 15. So we get into 16 at that point. So in 15 and 6, or so, so up to 15, up into this point, he's saying there are these in Israel who are whoring after other gods, both literally and physically. There's sexual immorality and um, there's mixture of this Jewish religion and Baal or, and Asherah worth it, worship. All this is kind of well, synchronizing it's not, it's together. Not, it's not a syncretism. Oh, it's not a syncretism. It's not a syncretism. It's a, uh, it's a hypocrisy. I see. On the outside, everything's Jewish, Jewish, Jewish. Everything's, uh, we love Yahweh. Oh, the temple's awesome. Mm -hmm. Chapter seven, Jeremiah says, hey, don't say this anymore. And what do they say? Oh, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. It'll keep us safe. So they, they were saying things like that. So these, these prophetic words are peace, peace, right? Where yes. we have a pattern over and over in the scriptures of mm -hmm. when sin abounds, judgment is coming, right? Yes. This idea throughout the scriptures of Israel doing poorly, Israel doing bad, and God bringing in an enemy to, to bring judgment, or he himself comes in and stricken judgment over the people. And they're coming in and saying, look, no need to repent. It's all good. It's like all good. there's nothing but blessing and peace. So so when culture is rampant with sin, when things are getting darker and darker, and hey, are we right? What's the word of the Lord? And it's like, hey, that's it's the easy peace word and blessing. God's gonna prosper you. It's like mm. is he though? Yeah. So 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 <laughs> Okay, Michael Scott. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so in in that uh in that in that context, is that I mean, is that is that what we're what we're grabbing on hold of here? Is that we're looking at a people that are that are immensely sinful, immensely wicked, even more wicked than those they they scoff and scorn. They're even mm -hmm. more wicked than those, uh, and this is allowed to continue because they're prophesying peace and blessing. No, it's in in some sense yes, because the people don't give a, aren't given a chance to repent, and because of that, he goes on later to say, "I God's like I hate that." That's what you're doing. You don't give these people a chance to repent because you won't listen to my word and, and speak it. Mm. Um, but what he also says now that the, what you don't want to do is because the general language in the prophets, there's a lot of times there's this uh, sense in which the words um, like immorality or evil, we always want to just boom, make them huge, make them mm -hmm. epic. And the kind of evil that he says they have here doesn't look evil even though they're worse than Samaria. So whitewashed tombs evil. It's whitewashed tombs evil. It's, it's, he, Tithing mint and cumin, but heart being full of adultery and wickedness. Bingo. Yeah. Um, Self-absorbed. Yeah. And narcissistic. that's, and, and people have often taken uh, the, the last part of uh, verse 14, you know, where it talks about Sodom and Gomorrah to say, oh, they were as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, that's a bad reading. You're not reading the text. Mm. The text actually is describing the severity of judgment mm -hmm. that is going to be brought on the land because of their sin not the description of the sin. Mm. So, that, and that's, that's kind of important because you can easily be like, oh, they were wicked people and they deserve judgment and the prophets were just like, peace, peace. That's not the picture that is being given So us. in the same way that like Ananias and Sapphira are, you know, lying about the yes. money that's given, was that as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah? Doesn't look like it. Sodom and Gomorrah was pretty nasty <laughs> doing some real messed up stuff. Um, was what Ananias and Sapphira did bad? Absolutely. But we have like this kind of parallelism where you have God's people, God's glory, swift judgment. And then you have this other context where it's like not God's people, far away, patient and long suffering, right? Yes. So so we have this context where it's like this is talking about the consequence, not necessarily what is deserving of the consequence being equal. In, yeah, and the severity, the severity of um uh the level of how he's going to decimate the country. Mm -hmm. Literally. I mean, when, when all is said and done at the end of the exile, you look at the temple, Lamentations, a good read oh, Lamentations, yeah. and it looks like hailstones just pummeled the place. Mm. So, so he's saying, he's saying the, the consequences, like you said. Now, when you get what you were talking about just a second ago is actually what he talks about uh, in, the in, the next section, in the next section. Great. Let's do it. He says, uh, 16 through 24. Yeah. Yeah. And I titled this, uh, 
don't listen to, to those serving you a nothing burger. Come on. Because because in, in verse uh, in verse Sorry. sixteen in verse sixteen he says he says thus says the Lord of hosts uh, I do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you they lead you into futility that word futility uh, some translations use vain hope um, it's actually the same word as vanity in in Ecclesiastes mm. so what they're giving you is really they're leading you to a nothing burger mm. and. If you, if someone's going to serve you something that that is that is not going to do you any good, that is really just um, coding over your sin. And this is the thing about reading this text: you read this text, and you have to keep it in its historical setting. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, if you're in a culture that is devoutly religious, but also devoutly immoral, mm-hmm. that there are there are double devotions going on, mm-hmm. then. You have an easy word from the Lord. You don't even have to pray much to, to find. Destruction is coming. Pray and ask and beg. Personal repentance always start there. Yeah. And then pray for others' repentance. And then if the Lord says speak to others, speak to others. If you're in a place of a position, you better be speaking. Uh, because a repentant heart is the center of everything that we do. Right. Without it, we're not reflective people. Without the, the act of continually confessing to each other, we're not the kind of reflective people that these people became because they were not reflective at all. They never reflected mm-hmm. on their sin. And because they never, this one confession is such an important discipline in the church mm-hmm. is um, people being able to confess to one another constantly. Um, it makes you very aware in the best of ways mm-hmm. uh, to be able to everything from the presence of God to his forgiveness and mercy to the context of the gospel. It, it unfolds those things inside you. Like a rose. So in Jeremiah's day, in right? Jeremiah's in day, Jeremiah's day, getting getting th- there's this off. there's this there's this bumper of hey, know your doctrine because your your bad doctrine, your your poor view of morality mm-hmm. uh, is producing these kinds of effects. Like you're, you're you're prophesying in kind of this nationalistic way. It's affecting the way that you're prophesying. Mm-hmm. Uh, secondly, uh, because you don't understand what the Bible, how the Bible talks about sin, you would know that it wouldn't be peace, peace, and blessing, blessing. Yeah, exactly. You're giving these people this big nothing burger. So in Jeremiah's day, the Jeremiah's instruction to the prophets were like, here are some bumpers for you. He's creating some bumpers. Doctrine, mm-hmm. super, super important. Uh not being apathetic towards sin as if it's a non-issue, like it's a non-thing, not just walking around with this religiosity, but dealing with the heart of the issue, Mm -hmm. something that's uh, very similar to like a pharisaical kind of, uh, the way that I read the New Testament anyway, the Pharisees and Sadducees and the the scribes seem to to manifest this quite well. and, and And to add to that in terms of application, we have to understand also we're in a day and age with social media Mm -hmm. that um, is never been easier. It, it, it is pushing us towards, and people don't realize this, but take a step back and think about it. The, the, the habituations that are, that social media and other things put into us, uh, have us going through over and over and over, uh, make us the kind of people that at the end of the day, we're more concerned about how people perceive us. Mm-hmm. We're more concerned about the outward, the image, the person that we project, right. the persona, as we say in psychology, the persona of who people think you are. Our brand. Our brand, exactly. Yep. And and because of that, we're literally being made into a culture that is just as self-righteous as the Pharisee and just as immoral as the pagan. That's and good. that's a scary thing. And that's on both sides. That, that, that has nothing to do with only the hyper charismatic or no, that's charismatic all of us. community that's all, of us. all Christians under the banner of the west are right. wrestling with this right now and, and and those are good things that can be used well sure you know i mean i don't want to say we're supposed to be above reproach we're supposed to have good character but we need to understand that that the um that that things like taking good spiritual disciplines of fasting from social sure. media and stuff like that actually good very good for you because these things habituate patterns you mean taking a break from social media not fasting from social media right Yes. Thank you. I think I said fasting, didn't yeah. I? Yeah. Uh, the, those are one of the, me and Dawson go back and forth. Like fasting <laughs> means drinking water. That's what, that's, that's my Hebrew understanding of the word fast. It means you drink water. If you're fasting your Xbox, that as means the, that you have a problem. There's nothing. As a metaphor. Yeah. 
Yeah. You, you know, you always start, you make something a metaphor, metaphor you can easily you like, get away, get away with anything. it. Yes, get exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's, let's get back to the text. Okay. Uh, in verse 16, uh, he basically goes from that first, verse 16 to, uh, to explain the two reasons y- um, you shouldn't listen to these people. So he gives these two reasons. Um, the first one is basically uh, because their, mes- their message has a man's perspective. It's just a perspective of man. Uh, he says they, their visions are their own imagination. Uh, and then in verse 17, it's this very interesting thing. Verse 17, there are two descriptions of the people that are hearing the message. And there are people that despise God and people that walk in the stubbornness of their mm-hmm. hearts. Well, okay, that's not a very good people. Um, if they are literally s- saying that they despise God and they're so stubborn, it literally is the thing that you know about them when you watch their life. Mm. Uh, so they're unrepentant is another way to say that. So from that, you get their message. What message do they do? There's, there's a huge incongruency here. And we've talked about this. So mm-hmm. this is what it's getting at. That incongruency of uh, their message offers security and peace to an unrepentant people. Verse 17. And then in verse, uh, that's actually just all of verse 17 there. They say, uh, they, he says it two different ways because he's describing multi, just a kind of a swath of a lot of different sermons from these guys. And he says, you know, they keep saying, this is an ancient message of faith without repentance. Mm-hmm. This is an ancient message of faith without repentance. Like today we have preachers out there who are like really big into, hey, faith, believe, 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 but they don't preach repentance, right? How faith and repentance are one one subject. They're just two sides they're of the, the same, same coin. Thing. Yeah, yeah, they're just two sides of the exact same coin, one yeah. on the negative and the other on the positive, if you will. Yeah. Uh, don't do that and do that. Um, to turn to God for everything you have with all yeah. loyalty and all your love is to turn away from everything that is not him. That's right. So so this is a a facade of repentance. This is a facade of faith because it's only really one it's only half. Yeah, and it's it, only trust God, he'll protect you. Trust God, he's going to bring you peace. Trust God, but there's no real repentance. There's no turning of anything. I, like I said about Secker earlier, yeah. uh, uh, there's a great section uh, earlier in the book where where Jeremiah is doing this thing with shuv, which is his ver- word for turning. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the Hebrew word for turning. And um, he describes the people as people who can't turn, and, but he, he calls them to turn. And then he says, you can't turn because you don't turn with your whole heart, but you turn in the pretentiousness of your, in the, sh- in the uh, secor of your life. Mm-hmm. In other words, you look like you're turning, he basically describes a false repentance, a, mm-hmm. a turning that, uh, that has all outward form, but has none of the inward substance. This is the same passage where he commands them to turn, oh, oh you turnless ones. Yes, exactly. That's <laughs> stinking hilarious. Okay, sorry. I hope I'm not taking your, your left hook. No, no, no. That, later, was not my left that was not good, my good, left good, hook. That was not my left hook. Because we get to a, a, a big section in Jeremiah, which is 18 through 22, which is uh, the section where it talks about, he says, But who has stood in the counsel of the Lord uh, that he should see and hear his word? Who has given heed to his word and listened? Now, these are rhetorical questions. Mm -hmm. Um, Down in, you know, you go, you go down through that. He's basically saying, um, what is the essence of you shouldn't listen to these people because they haven't taken the time to listen to God mm-hmm. because they haven't been privy to the counsel of the Lord. Now, how would, again, how would, do they know this? Like we have the court prophets. I'm just thinking of context here. The court prophets are before the king, but are the court prophets just like hanging out in local communities prophesying? Like, do they these know are, these people? The reason, the reason Jeremiah was so upset in verse nine is because he knew these guys. Mm-hmm. And I don't think, I don't think he was buddies with them. Sure. Maybe one or two, who knows? Yeah. But, but what we do know is because he was a priest. Mm-hmm. I mean, he he was a priest. So I mean, were they nationally recognized? I mean, it's not like they had syndicated radio like we do. No, you know, it's not. And I'm asking like legitimately. That's not satirical. Like, um, I'm mean, obviously it's somewhat satirical. But everybody like, knew Han- Hananiah. You see, that's my thing. Is like, how do they? How did they all know these guys? Was it were they like letters circulating? Like, 
did they all literally come out to hear these guys orate or like no, they're, what, they're, was, they're, what they're, were these prophecies? How were they functioning? No, they're probably probably that's the case. The reason I say that is we have archaeological evidence of a letter from Jeremiah, possibly from mm-hmm. Jeremiah to a to an outpost okay. uh, during the siege. Um, Telling them to stand strong. Uh, I can't remember it, the, the, all the details of it, but there's archa- that's a that's a non biblical archaeological mm-hmm. evidence of um, of prophetic writings. Uh, you know, just yeah, prophetic writings that's that that is encouraging a people to do something. I see. Um, so yeah, they were doing things like that, um, and they weren't just sitting around there, you know, going, oh, "Okay, so my turn to get up and preach." It's it was uh, they they were. They were encouraging the people, and that's so, the key. That's the key of the text. Actually, says that this these things, these peace, peace is in, is directed at the people. So they are writing. That's right. Letters. Yeah. They're preaching. They're preaching to people. They're preaching the temple, um, well, in the gateway of the temple, and they often took turns doing that. Um, but what you see is that's what's directed to the people. But then there's also this counsel to the king that becomes very important because even though he's a like a Jebediah, uh, I always get all my J's when it's confused. Uh, the Josiah's son, mm-hmm. uh, he started a building project that in chapter 22 of the same book, uh, Jem- Jeremiah, he uh, gets denounced for, for basically oppressing his own people to build the project. Mm-hmm. Now, there's there's court prophets like Hananiah who who are there and they don't say anything because they don't want to hurt their bottom line. You see, there's prophets like Jeremiah who don't want to hurt. No, their no, bottom no. Line? I'm talking about uh, like. Uh, Hananiah. Okay, me. okay. I want to make sure that we're talking about the yeah. same guy here. So they're, they're guys like Hananiah who don't want to hurt their bottom line because they have favor with the people, and right? Favor they're with prophetic the king. and favor with the king. So the there's an pleases. industry here. Yeah. There's there's an opportunity to have governmental power and authority and influence oh, in that there's you have the ear to the king, which is a thing people didn't have. Yep. Uh, and then you have a secondary that the masses knew who you were. You had this recognition. Yep. People knew you my name. Potentially, when you walked into a place, they would, oh, that's a prophet. That's one of the, the seers. That's one of the, the yeah. men of renown. And let, let me let me say this. I'm going to make a, you know, this is this is me saying this as Dawson. Um, this is also very similar to what we have today. Okay. Because... Um, if you know anything about, and you know this better than me, but if you know anything about uh, Pentecostal history, mm-hmm. uh, for years and years and years, um, there's a great book called, uh, I think it's uh, uh, The Disinherited, or basically it outlines the beginning years of how uh, Pentecostalism was shunned and mm-hmm. dismissed, and, and those are those, are those Demonic people. Demonic or anti-intellectual and, or yeah, and, foolish. And all those things, um, and the larger culture, the larger culture at large just did not accept any of that. Even with the charismatic movement, it was, it was you know, it was like your weird, weird uncle at, at Christmas dinner. Yep. You put up with him, but you sure certainly didn't want to talk to him. Yeah. And at the end of the day, um, there was a lot of this, dis- a lot of this uh, attitude like that for years, uh, even going up into to recent recent decades. Come recent times, mm-hmm. we have we had one president that actually reached out and circled around the charismatic evangelicals. Yes, and showed them for the first time in their lives. I mean, was, in the history of their organizations. Yes, uh, showed them favor and and actually wanted to talk to them yeah now listen if any president even if i don't like the guy tells me hey come eat dinner with me let's talk first of all that's a great opportunity to the uh, year of the king we talked about it (laughs) not many people got that (laughs) yeah not many people got that that's amazing yeah um and it's an honor yeah um and then you know i would i would go so but what that does... If it was Nero, I would go. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, like cards on the table, right? Yeah, like, let's just yeah. find the worst possible king, uh, governing official, president, ruler. Like, find the absolute worst one. I'd be there in a yeah. heartbeat. Like, And I would definitely be like, I don't really particularly like your... Uh, your, your, your style of dealing with my faith. But. Sure, 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 sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I understand I'll probably like your next barbecue party in this conversation. <laughs> Literally. Light. But uh, 
my gift is going to make room for me, right? <laughs> so uh, just make sure to put me up front somewhere. But what happened? What happened is is I I honestly believe in a lot of respects to a lot of those guys they they um they it were easily swayed by by the fact that you have the ear of the king, sure, and that creates a, a lot of loyalty. Yeah, I mean, there's there's just a very so it's, I'm not. Uh, and I, I don't want to get into that this political space too much. I'm just saying. I understand. I'm just saying that's a good example of of how. And I actually know of uh, one guy who, um, who actually told, you know, told like told Trump, "Hey, watch what you say." Yeah, this will get you kicked out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if if you don't find a way to make peace, and yeah, it was yeah, he he shared this word with us. Um, and and of these guys, let's let's just be very just let's pull the president even out of it. Like you said, political. Let's pull the political piece out of it. Um, the charismatic movement has become mainstream. Yes. Right? We begin to own, not just be on the Christian networks or the radio stations, we begin to own them. Yeah. Right? Like there is a huge push in missions, like mm -hmm. fastest growing missions movement in the world from the Pentecostal charismatic movement. Yes. Right? By leaps and bounds in South America and Africa and third world countries, we're sending missionaries at the wazoo. We're exporting this stuff. And thus, as one of the strongest exporters, there's a bit of wealth that comes with that. And mm -hmm. they're buying up television stations and they're buying up networks yep. and they're buying up radio stations and they're, they're really have a high premium on using media to export that message. Uh, and in doing so, they become mainstream. So let's just even pretend like President Trump hadn't given them this favor. It seems as if this trajectory of, of having favor with people, it's a dangerous space to be in. It's yeah. a dangerous space to be in when if you don't have the word of the Lord, you might not come to that next conference or you might not be able to write that next book. But this entire industry has been built and predicated on the idea that you're going to be standing in front of influential people or you're going to be standing in front of the masses. And we actually were fueling this system. Uh, and I'm saying this as a guy who's on a microphone in front mm -hmm. of a camera yeah. speaking to 100,000 people yeah. on you know, YouTube. Um, so I acknowledge that there is some, some obvious, um, uh, I don't want to call it hypocrisy, mm -hmm. but there's like something that we're wrestling with. To your point, I'd go before a president, I'd go before a king or prince. If I have the opportunity to print in front of 100,000 people, I shouldn't not do it because it's like, oh, they're right. there's yeah. just this real reality that as human beings, we're going to put ourselves in a pedestal and we're going to begin to begin to to be uh, to speak in ways that are going to appease the masses, and we have to be very honest and aware of our our frailty of our own frame yeah. uh, that we would desire the applause of men uh, and of kings for that matter. Yeah. Um. So so we've got to we've got to wrestle with that and be aware of that. And that's one of these bumpers that we're talking about. Yeah, and the, and that's what Jeremiah is getting at with the council of the Lord. Yeah. Um. He's actually getting at that because what creates that bumper? What creates that space for you when you're only doing things for an audience of one? Mm -hmm. When at the end of the day, no matter what you choose to do, no matter how things play out in your in your ministry life, or it's always an audience of one. Mm -hmm. You're coming before the king. You're having that in, in, intimacy with him. You're standing before him, but you're more intimate with your lord. The king is your king, but he's not your lord. Your lord is Jesus. Yeah. Um. And when. When that, when you, when you would burn it down, if God said, burn it down, when you would walk away and never have ministry again, because God said, never have ministry again, mm -hmm. because he, he told you to do something that you had to, that, that, that was a matter of, um, calling a people to something that they weren't willing to do, but you were called to do it. How many of these five points have we run through? Not many. So two, let's go. Two? Are we on two or three? Uh, uh, we are on. We uh, actually this that was the last one of this section. So the next one is uh, is in twenty three. Okay. So here's the thing. We've already filmed for an hour. Do you want to come back and do a part two? Do you want me to come back? And I do absolutely part? do. I just don't. I, I I don't know if we can we can keep cricket. I think if we were able to get through two of those, and we've got another three. We can come back and do a part two of Jeremiah twenty three. I mean, Jeremiah 23 is a, a lengthy chapter. It wouldn't be wrong to handle it in two hours. You comfy with that? Yeah, I'm fine with it. Okay, so let's let's put a let's put a pin in this because I really I really enjoy it. I like 
the trajectory. I like some of these application points that we're able to kind of pull from our local context because there's just so many similarities. Yes. We don't want to, and I, we talked about this before, we don't want to disconnect the, the, the historical context yeah. of of this is that, right? And say, yeah. hey, when you read this, that's what's going on in our day. And then you point no, no, fingers. No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Jeremiah, this is what happened in Jeremiah. And there's this cautionary tale that we can look at and go, wow, look at what the, these little five areas, for example, look at these five areas where the prophets missed it and how it caused so many problems. We should today, as continuationists, people who believe in prophecy, should look at Jeremiah and go, wow, what a cautionary tale. We should make sure to apply these things to our lives and our churches as well to avoid these kinds of things. So, so we've come through a few mm -hmm. of those. We've got some historical context, uh, and we'll probably knock out the next piece uh, and maybe upload it to Patreon. Uh, mm -hmm. This one's definitely going on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, um, and maybe upload the second piece to Patreon, maybe upload the second piece next week, but we'll see what happens. Anyway. And at the end of the day, Jeremiah's main point is you're a prophet if you've been in the council of the Lord. Mm. You're not a prophet if you haven't. That's good. So... And and the, and and then the sad thing, int intimacy, because the yeah. sad thing is, God almost to break. You can hear him breaking his heart. Yeah, these guys, that middle group, not the the false ones, but the, he says, if you had, mm -hmm. if you had, it was not he. It's not that he wasn't speaking to them. Mm -hmm. It's if you had taken the time to listen, mm -hmm. if you've been reflective and gotten out your bad beliefs, if you've taken the time to. Be with me, mm -hmm. which which meant revitalization of both their mind and their heart, not uh, me sitting meditating, you know, trying to uh, have some kind of transcendental trance. It's, yeah. It was a matter of me renewing my mind with the word because those bad mm -hmm. beliefs were hindering their ability to re uh, to understand the things God was actually giving them. Yeah. And so they they have a dream. They didn't know if it was from God or not. They think it was. And they were screaming, peace, peace. And to mm -hmm. me, that kills me. It kills me because I don't want to see what God has given people wasted. That's good. And um, I, there's like that passage in Ezekiel too, where he's like, there is something like I was looking for someone to stand in the gap, but I found none, right? Like this yep. passage where he's like, I'm just looking on the earth for someone to listen. Um, and I, I think there's something to be said about that, um, that God is is looking for those to, to be with and to share with yep. um if we're in you talk about intimacy even just to draw us in to a conversation with him to and, seek the lord and you know me and you can talk about this for forever forever so that's, so let's, that's let's, probably our problem that, that, right that's now. how we gotta wrap yeah. up which which i think i think is good i think that's a great thing that people people want to listen to biblical exposition and and guys grappling with the text thank you so much for the study that you put into this the commentaries that you've bought the guides that you've <laughs> the, 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 the the three months you've taken to to dig into jeremiah 23 uh for those of you who are online who watched our new year's eve prophecy video you saw uh, dawson do a 20 minute teaching on jeremiah 23 and you were like hey get that guy back on get rid of roundtree we're doing this because <sighs> of you None of no. y'all said. None of y'all said get rid of Roger. No. I'm just picking on him because he's on a writing sabbatical. Uh, <laughs> this is last week. I think we'll get him back next week. So oh yeah, that's exciting. Uh, but for those of you who've been blessed by this video, I would really encourage you. Please give. Uh, there's a couple ways you can do that in the description of the video here on YouTube. Uh, you have a PayPal link for a one-time gift, or you can give on Patreon as low as five bucks a month. Uh, but as always, if there's a specific Patreon video that you've seen in our feed, we typically post them on Facebook and on YouTube. If you see one that you're like, wow. That's when I really want to watch, but man, I can't afford five bucks a month. What I'd encourage you to do is send me an email at media at theremnantradio.com and uh, I will review those. I'll send you a kind of a link to that specific video and you can watch that. I never want uh, a paywall to prevent you from getting content that would benefit and educate you as an individual, but this is a way that we as a ministry are able to... Uh, fund what we are doing. It's not free. It's not cheap. And uh, it's certainly not easy. Uh, it takes a lot of time and effort to do what we do. Uh, Dawson has spent so much time on this. Uh, and I'm thrilled because he's going to resource you guys with really solid stuff that you can continue in your study that that lapses beyond a single hour long episode or even two uh, one hour long yeah. episodes. So uh, that's good. We want to resource you not only tell you what the Bible says, but tell you how we came to the conclusion of what the Bible says um, so that you know how to read your scriptures on your own. Uh, I hope this video has been uh, both kid educational and encouraging for you. I said Edu-couraging. I was like trying to put those words together. Uh, we'll see you next week. No, we'll see you tomorrow uh, at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. Me and Miller are doing another episode on the gifts of the Spirit. Catch you guys later. Blessings. 
Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode of Remnant Radio. Uh, if you like this video, we actually put together a playlist that has a whole bunch of content just like what is in this video. So I hope you enjoy. And if you got a little bit of extra spare time, maybe check out some of those other videos.